television highlights of the news of yesteryear. All's quiet after troops arrive, so there's no barking of these guns forming barricade across streets. Mill men and workers promise peaceful settlement of strike, and so soldiers head back to army barracks in swank automobiles of day. October 1919 is month of meetings and conferences in nation's capital. Bernard Baruch is here to represent American people. Secretary of Labor Wilson speaks for federal government which wants workers back in mills. Spokesman for woman laborers is Mrs. Conboy, but talks fail and strike goes on. In fact, strike spreads to coal mines as John L. Lewis and labor rights William Green and Samuel Gompers enter the picture. United States Attorney General Palmer asks court aid in preventing spread of strike. But here in Indianapolis, Indiana, officers of United Mine Workers leave federal building with counter orders to miners to walk out. And here in Beckley, West Virginia, as in other mining towns, soldiers once again appear to police strike-bound areas. Winter comes and struck mills and mines remain idle well into 1920, when conferences affect settlement, and miners and mill workers go happily and eagerly back to work. In the 1930s, youthful James Dunn of Hollywood introduces three newcomers to Mayor Porter of Los Angeles. Mayor Porter, may I present Miss Linda Watkins of Boston, Massachusetts, our blonde. Miss Watkins, allow me to congratulate you. You are a most fortunate young woman. Thank you, Mayor Porter. Now may I introduce Miss Conchita Montenegro from San Sebastian, Spain. Miss Montenegro, let me congratulate you also. It is fitting that a beautiful daughter of Spain should make a new conquest in California, the land of Cortez and Balboa. Thank you, Mayor Porter. Now allow me to introduce Miss Helmack, our redhead from Rock Island, Illinois, more recently of the New York State. Miss Mack, let me congratulate you too and hope that you will go far. Many thanks, Mayor Porter. Shall we drink to that, Mayor Porter? I propose a toast in my favorite beverage, California orange juice. To you young ladies, may you all be stars. But the future held three different fates for these Hollywood hopefuls of the early 30s. It's 1920, and Governor Smith of New York visits famed Sing Sing Prison at Ossining to lay cornerstone of penitentiary's newest addition, the Classification Clinic Building. State Senator Sage, who wrote bill providing for clinic, speaks at cornerstone ceremonies. And then Governor Smith takes active part, getting final construction underway. 
As expertly as professional bricklayer, he spreads cement under cornerstone, and Sing Sing gets a brand new prison wall. Here's Max Goldman, better known to stage and moviegoers as Max Reinhardt. It's 1923, and Reinhardt arrives in America aboard liner Aquitania to tour nation with his pageant play, The Miracle. He was later to become leading director of outstanding productions from Hollywood. Here's Norman Rockwell with Mrs. Rockwell in the early 1920s. While still a young man, Rockwell gained international fame as cover artist and magazine illustrator and as interpreter of American youth and village life through his more serious paintings. Norman Rockwell, great American artist. Here in 1920 is Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis at work at his desk in Chicago. Famed black sock scandal is talk of a nation, and Landis is soon to leave the bench to become internationally famous as first czar of baseball, game's highest office. It's 1928, as explosion in gas lines below London streets has all earmarks of miniature earthquake, as pavement cracks and crumbles from effects of blast. London bobbies say it's miracle no one is killed, but scores are injured walking streets or riding in taxicabs such as this. Damage of blast is extensive as miles of city streets are ripped like paper and escaping gas burns for many hours. It's 21st of May, 1927, and at Crockett, California, it's dedication time for then world's largest highway bridge. Governors Young of California and Balzar of Nevada are among dignitaries officiating at historic ceremonies, and giant steel and concrete structure is christened by Mrs. Avon J. Hanford. It's named Carquinez Bridge. Homing pigeons wing exciting news to all important cities in America, that work of Chief Engineer Charles Durdeth and Oscar Klatt of American Toll Bridge Company is successfully completed. Now is permanent link between Northern and Southern California to provide swifter north-south travel by car. Notice luxurious limousines of time making opening day trip across Giant Bridge. There are bridges to come to make Carquinez Bridge seem small and cars to come that make these look like something from prehistoric times. Here in early 1930s, pilots of England's Royal Air Force thrill 150,000 Britons as they master the perils of precision flying. Flights look as if they'll crash into each other, but groups are actually flying over and under each other at different levels. There's possibility of disaster in sudden appearance of air pocket, though. And here's something that was truly daring in early 1930s. For here are six airmen dropping from Air Force transports in what was then considered mass parachute jumping. In war still years away, hundreds of paratroopers were to drop from skies over enemy territory in truly mass maneuvers in the air. But this was great accomplishment and spectacle then. Veterans of small but dramatic roles in World War I show their daring as they stunt planes only a few feet off ground. Here's art of hedge hopping with true artist at controls. In slow flying planes of early 1930s, this was dangerous enough. But can you imagine any modern jet pilot taking these dips and turns in so small a space? Even at half speed, later planes would zoom out of sight before pilot could make his turn. Beauty and the Bob. It's 1927, and in those days, what happened to lovely locks shouldn't happen to a hedge of weeds. But this beautiful brunette even allows herself to be measured for murder. If she lets her hairdresser get away with this, she'll look like a man in need of a haircut. 
Wouldn't Lady Godiva have been in an awful fix if she'd gone horseback riding in 1927? In spite of the close-cropped hair, our beauty is going to have a touch of something feminine, thanks to an expert manipulation of the hairdresser's comb. But will that weak-looking wave really keep her ears warm this winter? Well, here's a look at our beauty looking her beautiful best in a hairdo that was considered just heaven in 1927. Bunyan Derby. It's 1927, and Los Angeles is terminus of second Bunyan Derby, cross-country marathon sponsored by promoter C.C. Pyle. And here is Salo, the winner, walking toward finish line with Gavisi, another early finisher. There's big crowd on hand to cheer Salo to end of his 3,000-mile journey from New York to Pacific Coast. And here's eighth walker to finish. He's Herbert Hedeman just 55 years old, who made the grind in spite of wearing weighty beard. 12-foot triumph. It's 1934, and here's start of three-mile jaunt of crews from Washington and California on Lake Washington, Seattle. Off to fast start, crew of Golden Bears grabs early lead and looks a cinch to hold it. Fans follow apparently dull race until suddenly Washington 8 steps up the stroke and pulls alongside the Bears. In strong burst of speed, Washington pulls ahead and roars toward finish line at pace too fast for California crew. Washington is winner, but the margin of victory is just 12 feet. <laughs> 